So my name is Philip Benz. I'm sitting here with my colleague, Chaoling Zhang. Um, we are, one second. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I was hearing myself in my headphones. Um, we are, so I am a fourth year PhD student. Chaoling Zhang is a third year PhD student and um, we are doing both our PhD at the Korean Advanced Institute of Science Technology or in short, uh, KAIST. And we are um, doing our PhD in the Robotics and Computer Vision Lab. Um, our talk today will be of our uh, joint research topic, which is basically um, adversarial machine learning. And today we will also go a little bit beyond that. And, um, Okay. Okay, and um, the agenda of what we will talk about today is the following. We will have a very small overview over what actually adversarial machine learning is. We will talk what are adversarial examples. We will cover some adversarial attacks and some adversarial defenses. And then we will dive a little bit more into our research work, which um, mainly covers a lot of universal adversarial perturbations and there we will look at adversar universal, universal adversarial perturbations with class discrimination. Then we will also cover one work where we look at how do these universal adversarial perturbations actually work and try to understand them. Then comes the beyond part where we also will still cover perturbations, but now from a different perspective. And we will look um, at universal deep hiding. So uh, there we will cover information hiding and such topics. And in the end, we will try to unify this universal deep hiding topic with this universal adversarial, adversarial perturbation, perturbation or, or adversarial, attack adversarial attack topic. Okay, then I would say let's get started. Uh, just uh, because you guys are sitting next to each other when one is talking, so it echoes from the other. Chowning, I muted you for now. When when you want to speak, just unmute yourself and you can talk, okay? Now we can hear it clear. Uh, okay. Ah, now I am also don't hear myself anymore. Perfect. Um, so previously, uh, we have seen that deep learning is awesome. Deep learning has achieved so many great tasks. So we have seen object detection. Um, in Joe Party, then all the projects by OpenAI, DeepMind, now recently uh, the AlphaFold project, then all those assistance systems, of course, autonomous driving, and um, also in robotics, we see uh, deep learning is now basically used everywhere. But there is also this other topic, which is adversarial machine learning. And the entire objective of, of adversarial machine learning is how can we actually uh, fool those um, deep learning methods through some malicious inputs? And one might ask, why is this important or what is the practical relevance? Yeah, well, this is actually a very important topic from the security perspective because we also need to ask ourselves if we can trust the models um, that we are using in deep learning from uh, over time um, in security sensitive applications. And also this will give us a theoretical or might give us a theoretical um, advantage because we also want to understand why maybe certain inputs um, will lead to a misclassification and let us better understand how neural networks actually work. So let's get started with um, some of the basics. First, what are adversarial examples? So what are we actually talking about? So deep neural networks are actually found to be sensitive to um, small perturbations in the image. And these small perturbations can lead to misclassifications. And usually these changes are not visible to, the, to a human observer. So for example, if we look into um, this example shown in the slide, we, are, we have an input image panda and we are adding some certain noise that is crafted in a certain way, which, will I, which I will introduce later more in detail. And 
we add this, we get this resulting image on the right. And suddenly this image is not classified as a panda anymore, but as a given. And as we can see, it's also classified as a given with a relatively high um, uh, confidence of 99.3%. Um, so more bring this more formally um, or more in a math equation like way. Um, first, our objective is we want to uh, achieve a misclassification, um, which is shown yeah in this part. And uh, we want to um, have the perturbation has have a small magnitude as possible. Usually these magnitudes are constrained through some uh, magnitude constraint, which is usually indicated as epsilon. And of course, um, we still want to stay in the image range such, uh, such that we don't go out of this bound of normal images, because this would be uh, easily, easily give away that um, something, a uh, manipulation has been made. And usually um, to measure these adversarial perturbations, we are different distance metrics are used in the community. And very simply, they are just the, the norm over the, uh, over the perturbation. And we are mostly actually seeing the L2 and L infinity norm, but also the L, uh, L2 distance um, is also often used. And what these basically, uh, what these metrics um, express is L2 norm is how many pixels did I change in total? L2 norm is um, over all the pixels, how big was my, was my change? For example, I can change all the pixels just a little bit, or I can change only a few pixels, therefore with a higher magnitude. And in the infinity distance, we are just looking at um, each pixel can be uh, changed through to some certain magnitude. But I would say for this presentation, we can mostly think of the perturbations uh, in the L L infinity distance, meaning um, I can change each pixel to this epsilon magnitude. Epsilon magnitude. And then maybe to um, summarize the, all the attack categories on a, on a very um, high level, um, usually what we see in adversarial machine learning, we have some certain target model that is already trained, for example, on the ImageNet data set. And um, we feed some image from this ImageNet data set into, uh, or try to feed an image into this uh, model. And we are adding some certain perturbation, which will result in the uh, adversarial example. And we get uh, our output in this, in case of normal uh, deep neural networks, it would be a logit vector. And um, the attack categories, we can we see that we have white box attacks where the attacker has full knowledge about um, the target model. Or, but there are also exist black box attacks where attacker has only limited knowledge about the model. And then we also can divide the thing in untargeted and targeted attacks where in the untargeted case, we really don't care um, to which uh, class our adversarial example is misclassified um, and the targeted attack where we really uh, care about that, that we want to misclassify a sample as a certain class. And here again, so I mainly already uh, explained the white box, um, sorry, the white box attack, uh, really full knowledge about the model, how it was trained, et cetera, et cetera. Black box attack, we really have no knowledge about our model. And usually um, what people consider there as a uh, very strict black box is that an attacker can only query the model. And then of course we have some gray area between that where we have um, gray box attacks where the adversary has some information about, about the model. And as I already described, the untargeted versus targeted attacks. Again, untargeted, I really don't care as what my original image is misclassified as long as it's misclassified. And the targeted attacks where I really care, for example, I want to misclassify this dog image as a cat image. Okay, so let's try to dive a little bit deeper into how do these adversarial attacks actually work. 
So there one is of a the question on the chat. Yes. Uh, so Ina asked, is the delta independent of x? I think yes, it was the, about three, four. Yes, um, I have to chat here. Oh, I try also to keep an eye on the chat. Um, the delta is independent of the x. Yes. Uh, I will be, no worries, I will be looking on the chat for you. So no worries. Okay. By the way, something I forgot to mention for everybody, the, this lecture slides are already available, if I remember correctly. If there uh, I are will, other references, I, yeah. Yeah, I will update um, the lecture slides again on, on, on our website um, because the ones that are uploaded are not the latest one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, if there will be other references and, and things we ask, uh, Philippe, I will ask you later on to send me them and we will publish for everyone. Of course, we, we, we can provide all the materials. That's really no problem, yeah. Okay, Thank you. then one of the earliest or the first attack that was really, or one of the first attacks that was proposed was the FGSM attack, which is a very simple and straightforward attack. And um, FGSM stands, stands for the fast gradient sign method. And in the uh, box there on the top, I, um, we wrote out um, the formula, how this is done. So if you look here, we have a normal loss function um, as commonly uh, calculated and um, we take the gradient, but this time we take the gradient with respect to the input image. And of this gradient, we simply take uh, the sign. So just if, if it is plus or minus, and we multiply this by our um, available magnitude, and we just add this to our image. That's really basically it. So maybe more in detail, if I have this panda image, um, I make a feed forward path through my model. Um, I should also mention again, the target model is fixed. So no network weights are updated during, during this process, since we are really trying only to attack this model. Um, so we feed, this, we feed this image through our model. We get this logic vector. We, as commonly, we calculate our loss, for example, with the commonly used cross entropy loss. And then we are trying, or we calculate our gradient, right? And we take the sign of this gradient and just multiply it by our epsilon. And very, maybe a very small detail, what you might be wondering. Um, usually what we're doing in deep learning is we're trying to minimize the loss, right? But if you would try to minimize this here, we would have uh, a minus sign. In adversarial machine learning, what, we're trying, what we are trying to do, we're always trying to go into the, into the opposite direction. That's why um, we, are, we have no minus sign. So um, we're trying to, yeah, as I said, going into the opposite uh, direction, basically having the opposite objective. And then another, I think, very important attack that is very often seen in the liter literature is the um, projected gradient descent, which is also very similar to the FGSM attack, but it applies um, the this the, uh, it applies it the whole thing in an iterative way. And um, the main differences here is we can see this is basically the same as we have seen before, but now we have an alpha value here, which is only a step size. And um, we, since this is iteratively, we going always only a little bit into this, uh, into the direction of the step size. And so we accumulate this uh, perturbation in the end. And of course, finally, we have to make sure um, that our perturbation overall is in the uh, magnitude constraint. And um, therefore we just clip it if we are in the L infinity, uh, in the L infinity space. So again, with this uh, small illustration here, we start again with the panda feed forward pass in our fixed target model. We get a logic value. We calculate our loss. We again calculate the gradient. We take the sign, but in this step, we only multiply it by the alpha. And the alpha is, of course, smaller than the epsilon. And then we get our first delta. We add this delta to our last image. And we result in our new image. 
we at least make sure that um, we are in the allowed magnitude range. And then we, we repeat this process with this new image as the input. And then this goes in circles. And usually for an attack, people use um, uh, uh, iteration size of seven. So I do the circle seven times, and then I get my resulting um, adversarial perturbation. So of course, in the literature, there are many, many, many attacks. And we try to summarize the most important attacks um, on this slide. And uh, we have already seen the fast gradient sign method. Then of course, we can also use this as a targeted, um, targeted attack where we simply swap the ground truth through some target class. But in this case, now we really want to go into the direction of the target class. That's why also this uh, sign here changes. Then protected gradient descent. We also talked about that already in the previous slide. And um, there is also a very interesting, very interesting attack, which is uh, named by the authors, Carlini and Wagner. And um, they are operate, they, there, they design actually a loss function um, for a very specific loss function for the attack. And um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to operate directly on the logit values and they're trying to uh, bring the highest logit just slightly below this, the second highest logit. So, and what overall, what they're trying to achieve is to minimize this perturbation overall. And they, they are incorporating um, their loss basically as a regularizer into their loss function. And then we also have the deep fool attack, which will be later very important for some other things that we will discuss. Um, but it's not very important that we understand, know that it exists, that you uh, later are not confused. But in a nutshell, what the deep fool attack tried to do is um, it views the whole problem from a decision boundary perspective, and it tries to push the samples over the decision boundary by just moving them um, on a parallel line to the decision boundary over the decision boundary. And so this is a geometry inspired approach um, but this is relatively slow. We also listed the pros and cons. Um, so, and then also now we saw a lot of yeah, computational methods, but um, some of these techniques also have been used for real world attacks in some or the other way. So um, here I listed, we listed a lot of works. So for example, these are 3D printed adversarial objects. And what they did is they um, made an algorithm to generate uh, perturbations that are invariant to transformations. So, and then they extend this to adversarial objects. And for example, here we can see all those turtles and um, those turtles are under a classifier classified mostly as a rival. And of course, if I just print, would 3D print a normal turtle, it would be classified as a turtle. But these are specially crafted 3D turtles that cause this misclassification. Then we have uh, black box attacks on web applications. And this is the classical case where we, for example, get a web, web application um, and we can query this web application with images and we get a, a classification output. And they apply some yeah, black box attacks on those web applications and also show that even without the knowledge of my targeted work, I can fool such, or I could fool such black, uh, such web applications. Then maybe more interesting for the, for autonomous driving, um, we also see attacks on traffic signs where people um, don't try or also try to add perturbations but also go into the direction of adding visible patterns um, that will fool the, uh, will fool a classifier. 
and then the adversarial patch. Um, the adversarial patch is really just a very small patch that I can place next to an object or um, have it like a sticker and put it somewhere. And um, the adversarial patch is obviously restricted in its, in its space, but the adversarial patch also has the specialty that it's not restricted in its ma um, perturbation magnitude. So you can see these patches become very colorful. And if you have ever seen um, something like Deep Dream, you, these look very Deep Dreamy-like. And also in other domains, we see um, adversary examples. For example, for audio, this becomes critical for applications um, just uh, for voice recognition, uh, which we already see in commercial products. Um, and also for such audio recognition, adversarial examples were crafted, uh, which I add to the normal to the audio signal, which then um, fool full classifier or, or, or detector. And um, then we also see adversarial variables, for example, like glasses against um, face detectors or on the right, this adversarial sweater, um, which can fool object detectors. And very um, interesting. This was, uh, I actually didn't see, didn't know of these examples before. Uh, super, super interesting slide. Um, there's a question, I think, from yes. two slides ago from Igor. In this um, slide? Yeah. Oh, this one, yeah. Um, what is the batch size in your experiments, picture by picture, or you can use larger batches? Um, this really depends on the attack. Uh, so here we basically um, handle image dependent attacks. And um, so the attacks are not. Uh, yeah, since we craft one perturbation for each image, the batch size does not really matter in those uh, in those scenarios. We can actually we we'll come later to um, to a topic of universal adversarial perturbations where we really batch uh, where we really batch over images to craft only one perturbation. But in here, for all these attacks that are shown, um, um, we yeah we craft one perturbation for one image, but we can process this in a batch. So for example, if I put in a batch of, let's say 128 into my network, um, I would directly craft um, a batch of 128 adversarial examples um, for those 128 images. I hope that clarified, I hope that answered the question. Yes, thank you. Okay. And I have a very short video about uh, this turtle. It's, it's only 20 seconds. So we can see, um, I, I, I use this adversary crafted turtle and it's mostly, I think, yeah, in this plot, it's mostly classified as a rifle. Um, yeah, I found this work very interesting because uh, yeah, the effort that they did with really crafting them with uh, 3D printers was, I found it very cool. Is there, a, is there an intuitive way to understand why this would be um, classified as a rifle? Um, there is a quite intuitive way, which we will also try to come later to speak on, but to give a small preview, what some of the research, so of course they are very different opinions, but the opinion that we will talk later about is that the adversarial examples actually form a certain feature of rifle um, that is then recognized by the by the, the deep neural network but these features that are crafted are actually not what we humans would say as a feature for example if i look at the cat this the cat has those cute ears that would we say okay that's a feature that we, I, as a human, think is uh, very nice, but those deep neural networks learn actually very, very small patterns um, as features. And some in the research community think that it's exactly those patterns that are exploited through adversarial examples. Okay, then we will go on. What can we do against those adversarial examples or adversarial attacks? And also there is a, uh, yeah, there is so many papers on adversary defenses, and um, 
but it's a very difficult topic because we have those attacks and we have those defenses and um, we can see, oh, some attack came out, then we have some defense and then again, maybe a few, sometimes even only month or weeks, another paper comes out and they say, okay, this defense is already beaten again. So attack and defense also here is kind of like a two player game. And it really mostly depends on um, who knows more will win this game. So for example, if I as an attacker know what the defender is doing, then usually I can adapt to this defense and I can win, I can win this game. But as a defender, if I can not let the attacker know what my defense is, so if it's really a secret, and um, then usually the defender has an advantage and can win this game. But yeah, it's, it's really a back and forth currently. And yeah, as I already indicated, um, we have easy defenses when the attacker does not know what the defender is doing. For example, we can very simply, we can take an encoder decoder and uh, denoise our image. And um, yeah, if I get an adversary example, I denoise it, I feed it into my network, uh, I'm done. I, I have successfully defended my this attack. But now comes the tricky part. If my defend, if my attacker now knows, oh, you're using this encoder decoder for denoising, then um, he can craft an adversary example that will actually fool both networks uh, in sequence. So it will first fool the or yeah, it will first fool the encoder decoder and it will go on and also finally fool the deep neural network in the end. So that would be then, um, yeah, the hard defense if the attacker knows what the defender is doing. And there what we've seen previously was that a lot of papers then try to come up with some defenses that are not differentiable because as soon as I'm not differentiable, I have a problem to backpropagate uh, with those attacks as we have seen um, previously, because we always need to calculate the gradient um, to, with respect to the input image. But if I'm not differentiable until to the input image, then I will have a hard time. And usually how people call this, um, this kind of defense, these are obfuscated gradients. And there was then another paper who said, oh, all those defenses, who try to use obfuscated gradients um, are actually de defeatable through some or the other uh, technique. And they, I think they listed really a few papers, maybe around 10, and they showed, oh, these papers all use a certain kind of obfuscated gradients, and here's how to break all of them. It's a very interesting paper, and I recommend to read it, uh, but it's also, I think, very technical, so yeah. Uh, which which is it the paper here on the slide, or uh, is it? Oh, I would. I think it's not here on the slide. It was in one of our previous slides. I'm sorry, um, but I think if you search for obfuscated gradients archive, it will directly come up. But I will, can definitely send it to you later again. Mm -hmm. I will add it to the slides. Um, by and, the way, Philip, and but anybody who's in the audience, just so you know, some of the people wrote their intro here. So we have master ML students, we have people working as chief data scientists. So no okay. worries about the technical, we can go deep. Okay, wow, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, then one of the most accepted uh, defenses is adversarial training. And adversarial training is nothing, nothing more than taking those adversarial examples and uh, training my model on them. So, and how this is usually described, if we have a decision boundary between two classes, um, then these would separate our classes quite easily. But now, if you think about those adversarial examples, we have some uh, room in which we can move um, through our epsilon magnitude space, basically. And as you can see with this room, we actually can cross this, this decision boundary and um, then in here would lie those adversarial examples or same as here. And then if I would train on those adversarial examples, um, I would adapt my decision boundary to be, uh, yeah, 
to divide my space a little bit better. That's conceptually um, how we can view adversarial training. And as I said before, adversarial training is really one of the one of the accepted defenses that people say um, this is a good defense or a possible good defense against adversarial examples. And adversarial training is also another rabbit hole that you can go down um, where people try to make adversarial training faster and of course more efficient. Because if I use adversarial training, inevitably my accuracy will actually decrease. So my, robu my robustness will increase, of course, and but my <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, my accuracy will decrease. There are also papers who tried now to mitigate this, this trade-off as well, um, but that should always be mentioned if we think about um, adversarial training. And when I say the accuracy decreases, um, it's usually like from my top one accuracy, uh, let's say one to 5%, I would say, depending on the, uh, on the data set, how my top one accuracy will decrease. But of course, I have drastic increases in my robustness. Okay, then let's come to one very special kind of adversarial perturbations, which goes back to the question before um, about the batching. And these are universal adversarial perturbations. And what universal adversarial perturbations are, um, they are perturbations where I try to uh, generate one perturbation that fools all of my images that I encounter. So until now, we have only talked about image dependent uh, attacks where I really craft one perturbation for one image and get my adversary example. Now what we will look at are um, image agnostic or universal adversary perturbations. And yeah, I have one perturbation and they can uh, fool all of those uh, images. And yeah, Basically, they also look the same as those adversarial examples. Um, and, but what is very interesting also, if we look at those uh, amplified versions, we can see, oh, there's some kind of pattern in them. And we will also try to look a little bit more deeper now uh, what, of, what all of those are. But first, maybe, again, the objective, we still try to fool our network through our perturbation for most data samples, um, but, and we still want to be smaller than this certain magnitude, so not much changed than to our previous, what we previously discussed. And before I start with this side, I think it's all, I think universal adversarial perturbations are very interesting because if you think about it, it's quite surprising actually that there exists one perturbation that we can really add to all those images and uh, we can fool all of them, even though the magnitude is so small. I think a lot of people, if I would ask them this question, if they think this is positive, possible, they would actually answer, um, I don't think so. So that's why we also try to investigate or try to investigate this topic a little bit more. And I think this is also one of our main motivations why we are, that interested in universal adversarial perturbations. Um, coming to this slide, so how do we craft those advers universal adversarial perturbations? Um, previously, we have seen this image dependent attack deep fool that I briefly described. And what this vanilla UAP did is nothing more than applying deep fool. Um, for one sample, basically pushing the sample over the decision boundary through some perturbation, keeping this perturbation and adding it to another sample. Um, so maybe with the pointer, I, I start from here. I, I use the fool, I push the sample over the decision boundary. So I'm now here. Um, I can now take a different sample at my perturbation and uh, go on. Um, and I do this iteratively for different samples and go on and go on. And uh, with this, I basically accumulate one, uh, this one universal adversary perturbation that I can then later add to different images. Um, 
how how is it possible to prove that this process converges or it, maybe i'm missing something here we are so if we if we think about adversarial examples we don't really have problems with convergence because we are really always only letting our gradients flow into our perturbation whatever they are the only problem that we can have is really it does not fool my image that's the only problem that we can have but no matter what gradient i get i just let it flow into my perturbation yeah but maybe i then i didn't ask right because you're iterating each time a different image sample yes and for that you're com computing the minimal perturbation for that image sample so how right. do you know if that minimal perturbation maybe um it moved in a direction that canceled out a previous image you've already processed. Absolutely possible. Yeah, nobody, mm. nobody. Uh, so uh, this algorithm, um, I would say, would, does not take this into account. And yeah, we, we will see later some other applications where I think maybe handle this a little bit better. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, this is what I described. And on the right is basically the algorithm which explains the same what I just described. So um, yeah, I already mentioned this a little bit. Image dependent adversarial examples um, also have one thing if we think about practical relevance. Um, for image dependent adversarial examples, we have to craft them for each sample, right? So if I re really want to attack a system and I don't know which images are coming in, then I would have to craft them on the spot whereby if I can get my universal adversarial perturbation somehow into a system and always add it to uh, any sample that I encounter, I would say this would be a more realistic attack scenario. And um, now we will try to go a little bit into the research that Chowning and I um, did. And um, there we want to look at different limitations of UAPs. Um, so as I previously, previously described, um, if I have a UAP, usually the UAP tries to attack each sample from each class. So if I think about an adversary uh, of autonomous driving, um, no matter what I would encounter, my car would definitely do something weird. Right, So it would be very obvious that some misbehavior is going on. So we thought, can we actually make um, one perturbation that is class discriminative? Meaning, can I only attack only a few samples? And then the, also the UAP generation usually relies on the original training data. And um, also the, and we don't understand the UAPs that well until now. And then also what we, we also have to question, can we actually use this insight for anything else except always attacking some deep neural networks? And yeah, I already talked about this. Uh, in these two works, we are trying to uh, have some discriminative uh, discrimination into our UAPs. Uh, in this work, we really try to understand the uh, UAPs a little bit better, what they're doing. And there we try to understand from a feature perspective. And we also, uh, with our understanding, we were also able to make a universal attack that actually doesn't need the original training data. So, and um, then we also applied our insights that we basically gathered from our previous works. And uh, we designed universal deep hiding, which we, um, used for steganography, watermarking, and light field messaging. And finally, we also tried to um, combine our insights from this universal deep hiding with our universal uh, attack knowledge. Question? Yes. Uh, do we assume that the noise, that the, the, the perturbations are always additive, or it's more general than that? Yeah, so I would say um, very, very most commonly, we really add this perturbation. There are here and there, I think only a handful of works 
where people try to multiply multiply the um, multiply some certain perturbation. But uh, if you think about it, since we take the gradient anyway, I think it will not have a big impact if we have an addition or or multiplication in that sense. Thanks. There, there is another question on the chat by Ina. Um, is there a way to cluster input data and have universal perturbation example per cluster? So I think it refers back to that uh, part where we can change the direction of the perturbation and then it might, um, it might yeah. ruin the previous images. If I understand the question, are there a way to cluster input data? Yeah, um, that's definitely, so if I understand the question correctly, I take let's say 100 samples, and I only craft a perturbation for only for those 100 samples. Yeah, and that would definitely be, be possible. But I think what will be difficult will be to guarantee that this universal adversarial perturbation only works for those 100 samples and not for some other samples. So I think there will be a certain trade-off that one would hit. Yeah. Okay, then, yeah, let's dive into those class discriminative universal adversarial perturbations. Um, yeah, it's very simple. What we're trying to do, instead of attacking all the classes as previously, we only try to attack uh, a few classes. And we have the objective here on the right, which really did not change uh, much from previous, from our, all our previous uh, objectives. And again, this should be one perturbation only. And um, I'm, I'm going very briefly over this paper because we will go more in depth onto in the next one where we did something quite similar. But if we look at the results, we actually tested a lot of loss functions um, which can be applied because in this case, we will have a targeted part and a non-targeted part. So we have targeted classes, which we want to decrease, and we will have non-targeted classes, which we want to increase. And naturally, there will, since we only really have one perturbation, um, we have a trade-off there um, that we have to achieve. And um, yeah, we tested a few loss functions um, where, we, where we used the cross entropy, or um, as we have previously seen with the with the Kalini and Wagner attack, where we just tried to decrease one logit, and we arrived that for the non-targeted, uh, for the targeted classes, we only tried to decrease the highest logit, but for all the non-targeted classes, the normal cross entropy loss is sufficient. And well, we tested this on uh, Cypher, but we also tested on ImageNet. But here we show the Cypher results. And I think what one has to pay attention is only the last column, which, um, yeah, the metric is basically uh, how many of my targeted samples are, are fooled to my, are just fooled, and how many of my non-targeted samples are fooled. So, and I just take a minus between, or yeah, I subtract those two metrics by each other. And this, uh, so I get a gap between those fooling ratios, so to say. So this means the higher the gap, the more the better, the more discriminative my attack is. And as you can see, yeah, well, we are quite discriminative um, for the cipher, for the resin 20 and the VGT 16. So meaning, yeah, it's really possible to make one perturbation that is class discriminative. We also tested this um, on, on the image net and we can see that those gaps are getting uh, a little bit smaller. And because with more complexity, of course, this becomes more and more problematic since we really have only one perturbation that we can add to all those images. But we think it's still very fascinating that this actually, uh, actually works. Uh, th and there then, is a question yes. by William. Do the properties of the adversarial perturbations give you insights into the properties of the training data set? Um, somehow, yeah. It's also a very interesting question. Um, what then the question, I cannot, I think I cannot fully answer this question because what are really properties of a training data set? I don't know 
how to how I would classify properties of data set. Uh, we can we can definitely get insight um, about what kind of features we learn um, from this data. Um, but I would say that's basically it. Of course, we can also see I, maybe one property that we can see through such attacks is which images can easily be attacked and which images can very hardly be attacked. I think that's something that would be very interesting maybe. I actually, I understand the motivation here for this question from my end. It's because the technique is a bit similar to Google Dream. Yeah. Right. So, so in, the, in Google Dream, the entire idea is to understanding the data set, the training data set. So that's why I would, I would think, hmm, maybe this is some way of um, averaging out the target class. If there is a target class, averaging out the target class characteristics. Um, yeah. So, but... Um, for, for the deep or for the Google Dream. Um, yeah, what we're visualizing there is where the, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely very similar to the Google Dream, just that we have this restriction on the perturbation, yeah. So, yeah, the motivation comes from my sort of background with synthetic data. And obviously, you know, when you see these uh, adversarial attacks, which just not like physically based, like the turtle attack, you could kind of look at the turtle and it's got little triggers, maybe, or little things which might be a little bit of a gun, but there's no structural relationship between them. Right. You can sort of see that the, the neural network's focusing on these. You can see the, 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 the aspects of the data that the neural network's focusing on. It's focusing on these little you know, individual features without looking at the structural relationship between them. Obviously, that's what's sort of uh, um, inspiring work on things like uh, capsule networks and what have you. But yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know it's quite clear that there's a sort of deficiency in the patterns that the neural network is learning it's it's latching on to these either spurious correlations or maybe they're real correlations but somehow it doesn't like represent something which is physically necessary in order to belong to a target right. class right. in an ideal world we would like to uh, we would like our machine vision systems whether the neural networks or not to be closely tied to the physical properties of the scene which are necessary in order for that uh, you know entity in the scene to belong to that class. Yeah, um, definitely. Whereas all the neural network can do, well, all any machine learning algorithm can do is find correlations. Um, and obviously then when we're exploiting those correlations which are, um, which are, which are learned, but not necessary in order to create an adversarial attack. That's kind of what I was trying to get, get to is like, can we understand that set of things which are learned, which are present in the data sets correlations, but which are not necessary for the physical item to belong to that physical class. That's where I was trying to like, because what we really want to tease out is like what correlations in the data are, have like a, um, this kind of physical necessity of being there and which ones are just there because they're there. Yeah. Um, I think what, what there is really interesting, if we, for example, so how we often see this universal adversarial put or in general perturbations is we try to understand them as what did our model learn? So what kind of features did our model learn? And you did know that uh, that is the model? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, we currently try to see uh, try to understand what did our neural network model learn. And now there's um, also one interesting thing. If we take a mo normal model, we have those very weird, uh, if we do this deep dream, for example, we don't have a restriction on the magnitude, we get those kind of noisy patterns, right? That would, you would say, these are correlations between the, in my data, right? So this is what my, neural, what my net saw as small correlations um, between the data. But now, if I tr take an adversarial trained model, which is robust or more robust to those adversarial examples, and I do exactly the same thing for a certain target class, I can actually see that um, those small noisy patterns, I don't see them anymore, but I see really f more features that we as a human could also recognize, yeah, well, that could be a plane that resembles a cat, etc. So um, we really see that if we do adversarial training on our models, um, 
these these patterns that we get through the spec propagation more resemble, let's say, robust features, which would be human uh, recognizable features. Uh, this is very interesting. Very yeah, interesting. We will have comment. one slide for that as well. Yeah. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope that answered the question. At least a bit. Oh, I don't have sound right now. Oh, we can hear you. There we go. Yeah, sorry, uh, I had the microphone muted. Yes, I think that this this particular question will take many years to answer. It's not something that's going to be answered within one <laughs> in one point. But um, I mean, I, I, <laughs> that insight was really interesting uh, about the sort of deep dream images after robust training and how they become more like things that we yeah. would recognize. I think that's really fascinating, and thank you for that. Um, okay, let's go on. I think I have to speed up a little bit that we get through the slides. Uh, in this case, also um, in the class discriminative attack, we have seen that only the um, that we only uh, uh, attack on the source side where we try to discriminate those classes. But in this attack, um, we were trying to um, craft one universal adversarial perturbation that we attack one, uh, only one class on the source side, but we want to get it to a certain class on the sync side. So for example, we only want to attack this turn right sign into a turn left sign while all the other classes um, are left basically in peace. And again, only one perturbation should be used for that. Um, for the loss design in a nutshell, what we're trying to do is we're trying to decrease the, only the logic of this attack class and try to keep all the, yeah, basically use the cross entropy loss for all the non-targeted classes. And we, how do we actually craft those, those universal adversarial perturbations is very, very different from how we do it with the deep fool. We basically, you could say, we are trying to train uh, a certain network weight. So what we're doing is, um, we we get a batch and uh, we feed this batch. So in this specific case, we get a batch of the targeted samples and some of the non-targeted samples. We put them together into one batch. We feed them into our network. We get a gradient, and we just use a simple optimizer like Adam SGD um, to update our perturbation. So instead of updating updating the network weights as we usually do it with the optimizer, we just use the a common optimizer to update the, the perturbation. So we really handle the perturbations as, um, as yeah, I don't want to say weights, but somehow or we, we handle them as network, train, uh, as network training. And in the end, the only thing that we have to make sure is of course to uh, obey the magnitude, magnitude constraint. So, and as you can see this, overall algorithm also then becomes much more simple than trying to push every sample over the decision boundary, et cetera, et cetera. And here, I also can just use batches to update my perturbation rapidly. And this is really fast. So this usually takes around two to three minutes and I get one perturbation. We usually do this for 1000 or 2000 iterations and then uh, one perturbation is done. And yeah, we really do only iterations. We usually don't even talk in epochs. So we really only need iterations. And also this double targeted attack. Um, yeah, since there's no previous work, we did not have to compare something uh, to do but, uh, with it. But overall we saw, okay, um, this, this double targeted attack also works very well over a lot of data sets, over a lot of models and um, it was quite successful. And we also tried to extend this a little bit that we have not only one uh, sample on the source side that we want to attack, but multiple class, uh, classes. And they all should go to one sync class. And also this worked, even though it was a little bit uh, harder to achieve, but um, also this is possible to achieve with only one perturbation. And if you look at those qualitative results, 
um, for example, this was the introductory example um, where we really turn this a turn right sign with such a perturbation, which is shown amplified here to a turn left sign with actually quite a high confidence or for the image net, the photocopier, which is turned into a castle with a very high confidence. And also we saw previously the adversarial patch already, but what we try to do here is this double targeted, double targeted patch. So we have this one patch, which really only attacks one class and leaves uh, what attacks one class to a certain other class and leaves the other classes um, yeah, alone, so to say. So for example, here with the screwdriver, this perturbation placed next to the screwdriver will actually turn it into um, a go-kart and uh, placing it next to a teapot, um, the teapot will remain a teapot. And yeah, same for the other examples. And then maybe now more related to the previous question uh, in this work, which we've published in CDPR uh, this year, understanding adversarial examples from the mutual influence of images and perturbations, we tried to go to try to more understand what is behind those adver universal adversarial perturbations. And maybe as a small background here, there was one um, previous paper, which was called Adversarial Examples are not bugs, they are features. And I highly re really recommend to also have a look at this paper because it was also a very big influence for us. And um, it's, for us, it's, it was a very inspiring work. So what they really try to do is they try to analyze what are those image dependent adversarial examples. So we are talking now again about image dependent adversarial examples. And what they try to do is they try to generate a non-robust data set and a robust data set. And if I train this robust data set, um, I get a good standard accuracy and a good robust accuracy, right? But if I train on a non-robust data set, I get a good standard accuracy and of course a bad robust accuracy. But now let's have a look how they actually achieved this. So we have this training image, which is a dog. And as we normally would understand, that this image has robust features of a dog and non-robust features of a, um, of a dog. I have to move this a little bit, okay. And um, now we are doing an adversarial example and try to fool this dog towards this, the class cat. And then we would actually relabel um, this sample as a cat. So now what do we have in this image? For us humans, this still looks like a dog, right? So we have those robust features of a dog and um, those non-robust features uh, of a cat. And now what we are doing is now we are training a classifier with this image and the label as cat, right? And after we train this classifier on this data set, we show it a normal cat, a real cat. And what we will get, and the classifier will actually say, this is a cat, even though it was previously trained with the wrong label, right? And that is really quite surprising um, because this shows that, the, that this deep neural network classifier actually learns those non-robust features that we exploit in those adversarial examples. And that's why we can still get a good accuracy. Of course, our, um, of our robust accuracy is really, really bad in this case. And then, um, yeah, here we tried to uh, show some of those data sets. So this is a, would be a normal data set. Let's first look at this non-robust data set. We can see, for example, here with the with the egg, some certain patterns. Um, if I if I backpropagate without magnitude constraint into this image, but as I said before, it's very interesting what happens here if I have this uh, robust data set extracted from a robust classifier, um, where uh, this one would be an airplane, this one would be a ship, this one would be a dog, and Again, I get those kind of dream, uh, deep dream like images, but me as a human, yeah, I could agree this could be a dog. I can agree this uh, could be a ship with some imagination. I can also agree this is an airplane, etc. 
And what they are then showing is they're training, again, a classifier on these data sets and they are measuring their um, robust and non-robust accuracy on the normal data set. So for example, this was generated with the Cypher, Cypher 10. And I train on these images, but I test on Cypher 10. And if I train standard training data set, basically Cypher 10, of course I get high accuracy, low robust accuracy. If I do adversarial training with Cypher 10, I get a little bit less standard accuracy, but very high robust accuracy. We can here see this little trade-off that we talked before, that we talked about before. But now, if you look at what happens if I train on this uh, generated data set, well, I get quite reasonable standard accuracy, and also my robust accuracy is also not that bad. And um, same uh, as we previously said, if we have if we train on this non-robust data set, um, yeah, quite reasonable standard accuracy, but very very low uh, adversarial accuracy, and. Um, we actually also did one other work which was related to that, uh, which we call data from model, where we try to exploit um, this same thing. We try, to, we try to have the constraint where we only have one model and we want to extract data from this model and then train a new classifier um, uh, on this data. And we actually did this for several rounds and um, why we could have quite high or could maintain a quite high standard accuracy. Okay, um, after this, now we want to go on and have a look at universal adversarial perturbations if you see some same phenomena. And therefore, we actually use the Pearson correlation coefficient. And what the Pearson correlation coefficient does is uh, measure the linear correlation between two variables. So for example, um, I take these two images here of this bird and this monkey, and I just uh, add them together and um, I get in this mixed, mm -hmm. I get this resulting mixed image. So I feed all those three images into a classifier and I get the logit values um, out of this, I get the logit values. So, and what I'm doing then is I'm plotting those logit values on of image A and this mixed image on the X and Y axis. And I get, and I see, wow, I get some correlation here, but if I plot the logits of this monkey image and this image C, uh, it's not that correlated. And you can measure this correlation by the Pearson correlation coefficient, which is quite high um, for, yeah, in this case, and relatively lower in this case. And if, yes. And if we look at the final, uh, final classification, actually um, our classifier also uh, classifies this mixed image as a bird. So that much for the introduction. But what happens now if we look, what happens if we put in those adversarial examples, image dependent or just random noise or uh, universal adversarial examples. So first as a baseline, we can say, I take this bird image again, I add some, I add some random noise to it and I look at the correlations. You can see it's still classified as this bird with a high confidence. And, <clears throat> and we see a very high correlation between this final image and this image A, right? And um, same, the noise nearly has no correlation. Uh, but now if I use this universal adversarial perturbation, this whole phenomena flips. So here we crafted the universal adversarial perturbation for, for target class C line and add it to our image. And now we can see, wow, this image nearly has no influence on our classification uh, anymore, but only this perturbation alone has a very, very high correlation with our final outcome actually. And the main conclusion, since we can see the logit vector as uh, yeah, a representation of the feature was that these universal perturbations contain dominant features by themselves. And finally, the images only behave like a noise to them actually. And at the same time, we also had a look at um, those targeted 
uh, image dependent perturbations. And we can see that finally, uh, neither the image uh, nor the perturbation actually have a very high uh, correlation with the initial image. And um, what we can see from that is that those adversarial examples only the only the combination of the image and the perturbation together uh, become such a become or craft some feature since the perturbations are image dependent. Um, yeah, we try to make um, a comparison between the previous approach and or how previously universal adversarial perturbations were seen and how we saw them. So really previous works really saw them as a bug, as some kind of noise. And also we come to the conclusion that UAPs also contain features of a certain class. And um, one, I think the rest of this slide, I already tried to explain it previously. Uh, this is a more summary. And what is meant you also what I mentioned before, this uh, crafting universal adversarial perturbations with the deep fool takes around, um, yeah, two hours, one or two hours. And, but we can craft those with the algorithm they have also shown previously, craft those perturbations quite rapidly. And now with this conclusion that those images only behave like noise to those perturbations, um, we thought, well, then those images seem not to be that, seem not to be that important and we can just uh, exploit any other images um, to craft our universal perturbations. So what we did is we just take a proxy data set, which is not the original training data set, and we craft universal adversarial perturbations with this proxy data set. And um, still we get very, very good, uh, a very, very good attack. So here is the generation process. I think, um, yeah, proxy data set plus perturbation through an ImageNet pre-trained model and backpropagation into the perturbation, same as previously. There is no magic happening here. And then we test this crafted perturbation on the, on the, on the original test data set. And yeah, all those images actually get misclassified or most of those images actually get misclassified as a C line. And in terms of um, uh, quantitative results, um, yeah, our, our attack is quite strong and outperforms um, previous uh, attacks which use the data, but also uh, previous attacks which don't use the data. And maybe also very interesting here, um, if we now amplify those universal adversarial perturbations that we crafted, um, we actually can recognize those features. So all those perturbations were crafted for target class C line. And if you could have a close look, yeah, you can recognize some uh, C, -line, C line features. And um, for the next topic, I will uh, go on to give the word to Chowning. And um, I would say I see you back for the Q&A session later. Thank you. Uh, I think Chowning will share the screen as well, if that's possible. So a small question. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh oh, small question. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, um, so I should uh, share the, oh, which one? Should be, no, what? Like the, like, like the slide? Okay, maybe I can use yours. Uh, one second. I don't want to get there. Where are the slides? Yeah. Huh. Ah, so I'm still sharing the screen, I see. Mm. Oh, you just want to go to my screen? Yeah, well, I thought it's still be easier. Uh, what what a, a conclusion so from... Easier, right? hmm? Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, now I will like take over and yeah, okay. As my uh, colleague Philip has introduced, for example, here, like if you have an origin image, which is uh, 
is dark, and if you add a small um, a human imperceptible perturbation, then you will get the perturbed image. But human, uh, if we ask the, what this image looks like, the human will say it's a dog, right? While the machine will say it's the cat. Next. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, then we try to extend like the insight that we get from the universal attack to the concept of universal adversary hiding, uh, to the concept of uh, universal deep hiding. And so, for example, here we have original uh, cow image, which has a which has a dog, and then we can add one um, very small uh, again human imperceptible into it, and then you get this new image. So now, if we present this uh, this perturbed uh, dog image to a human, if you ask them, what do you see here? Do you see any hidden secret? Probably not. You only see uh, dog image, but actually, uh, this dog image inside it actually has this very cute cat inside it. <laughs> okay, so basically, uh, just now I just give you like a very simple kind of overview of this uh, of this work, and so now I will uh, give you a little bit like the background of this. Uh, so. Uh, the concept here is called digital steganography, and the definition of, of it is to hide secret message within a digital file, such as images, uh, audios, or videos. And in this work, we try to hide secret message inside uh, an image. And the challenge of this task is the trade-off between the capacity and the secrecy. Basically, like if you hide more secret message inside this cover image, uh, then uh, then like the like the cover image, like this new container image now will look a little bit weird. So it's like it's easier to hide uh, like only a small amount of message, but it's not easy to hide a lot of a uh, message. And then uh, in 2017, there was one work published in New Ips, which is called Hiding Images in Plain, in Plain Sight, Deep Stagnography. And Deep Stagnography, uh, it introduces like a new task, which is to hide one full image in another. Um, this is very, very different from the Traditional stochastic, I would call it, uh, because traditional stochastic, the like it, like normally only hides um, a very small amount of binary message. For example, uh, it's like smaller than 0.5 bits per pixel. While the deep stochastic, it can hide um, like 24 bits per pixel. So the hiding capacity is much higher. And here. For this task, we uh, we focus on the visual quality, which is like we want the uh, the container image to look as similar to the original cover image as much as possible, and at the same time we want the the extracted secret mass image look very uh, like the original secret image. Yeah. Okay. Uh, before here, like um, and the thing I think I I forgot to uh, like mention is like for the task of uh, steganography, like uh, like the it's very important for the stochastography. It's very important for this um, for this uh, hidden uh, secret to not be detected by the second analyzer. Uh, but here, as I said, there's a trade-off since for the deep stochastic, since it's hard to hide like a lot of information. So this is almost inevitable that it will get detected. Uh, now I will introduce you where this, the motivation of this work come from. Uh, so as my uh, uh, coworker, uh, Philip has introduced before, there is uh, two types of adverse attack. One is called image-dependent 
adverse uh, perturbation. One is called the universal adverse perturbation. And then what, um, like that seminal work uh, introduced in 2017 New York, what it did was cover dependent deep hiding. So then we was thinking, can we actually like do, like uh, extend this like universal concept from the adverse attack to deep hiding? So yeah, then we tried to explore the possibility of universal deep hiding. And then this is uh, this like like our overall uh, uh, like a uh, new we call it uh, like new uh, new uh, meta architecture for the deep hiding because we don't like in here like here we don't care about the details of the hiding network or the details of the the agility network. We actually um, during our work we experimented with. Um, various kinds of uh, hiding uh, network and like different architectures and they have a very small influence on the performance. Uh, yeah, so here, like what we focus on here is like the main difference from our uh, work like UDH compared with the previous code uh, DDH. Uh, like the main dif like the main difference here is just say here we use we fit the security message into a hide network and then we get the encoded security image and then this encoded security image can be added to any random cover image uh, directly and then we get the content image this content image is sent to the receiver site and then the, the receiver site can extract this the secret message out of it and so i think we would agree uh, this the task of universal deep hiding is much more challenging than the than than the than existing uh, DTH uh, basically like cover a dependent deep hiding task because now the uh, like the hiding network cannot adaptively hide the secret based on the cover image, but somehow surprisingly we find that uh, our DTH actually achieves comparable performance as DDH. And the main motivation for us to, um, to propose this new uh, hiding network is for, for a facilitating visualization of how deep skin image is encoded. Because otherwise, if we get, this, get the same performance, what's the point of using this new uh, deep hiding architecture? So as we can see uh, on this slide, we find that we investigate, we find that this, um, this secret image, they have been encoded uh, uh, specially. So like what, what we have shown here um, on, the, on the left side is say we, um, we try to modify a little bit on the original secret image, then, then we try to measure the influence on the encoded secret uh, image. And we find that the influence uh, decrease with the distance to the pixel uh, modified, uh, which suggests that the secret image has been encoded, uh, like, uh, how say, like encoded in, in only in the near neighborhood. Um, on the special uh, dimension. So with this insight, so now we can very easily uh, visualize how the secret image is encoded. So for example, here, like we can get the original, uh, original secret image and then we get the encoded secret, secret image. And then for better visualization, we, here we have uh, three zoomed version of uh, patch one, patch two, and patch three. And for example, for patch one, patch three, you can see uh, a repetitive high frequency pattern, which uh, corresponds to the original uh, red or white region, which is which are just uh, just flat. And for the uh, why is this uh, visualization seems to be very straightforward and 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 important? Uh, why is this like it's kind of a big deal? 
uh, it's because if it's not under this UDH framework, if you use the original uh, cover dependent deep hiding uh, network, like you cannot visualize this directly. Uh, the reason is that that in code discrete uh, uh, perturbation is always dependent on the cover image. And then you will not see a, such a phenomenon. But then here, we try to play a trick because here like we have, uh, but like our work can still help uh, uh, visualize how the original DDH uh, encode the secret image. Uh, like, uh, so basically here we have the, like whole, whole pipeline have the hiding network H and the revealing network R. So now we try to, uh, combine like the like the edge in the UDH and then the R in the DDH. So by uh, by combining them, we can then um, we can also uh, visualize how the secret image is encoded in the DDH um, hiding network. And then for for uh, for this. Um, like our proposed UDH framework is very simple and straightforward, uh, but then we try to uh, apply it for uh, different applications. Like for example, here for the stagnancy, we continue to experiment with hiding uh, random M images in random N images. For example, we try to hide six images in three images. We also experimented with uh, hiding two color image one in one single image. And for human, you cannot see the, like, the difference. Um, and here on the right side, we also uh, experimented with hiding multiple secret images in one cover so that different recipients retrieve their respective, uh, their respective secrets. So for example, here we have the sticky image S1, S2, S3, and which are processed by the three hiding network respectively. And then we get the three encoded uh, perturbations, then which are just added directly to the same cover image. And then we, we end up with this uh, container image. And then we can send the same content image to three different recipients and then their uh, network, like their, their receiving, uh, their revealing network, R1, R2, R3, can only extract the corresponding secret. For example, like the R1 can only retrieve uh, S1, and like it will never get confused. For example, R1 will never get S, uh, S2, and this R3 will never get get R1. They will only always get their corresponding image. I, we think this is quite interesting because in, in practice, for example, like this is the secret communication between two parties. So the whole point is to, to avoid the third party try it here to intercept the containing image and then try to extract the secret uh, information. But in this context, actually, we can actually intentionally <laughs> leak See somebody here is not on mute. Um, here yeah. we go. Yeah. So here yeah. we can. So uh, here, like for example, we can intentionally leak the wrong uh, reading network to the third party. So for example, like like the real hidden information can be the S three, but we can actually intentionally leak the R one or R two to the third party to to the bad guy, and then he will get the intentionally misleading message. Uh, if it's okay to ask a question, I'll, um, sure, sure. Uh, if we can go back to the previous slide. First of all, this sounds a bit magical, yeah. especially maybe I'm missing something. Mathematically, how can you, in, let, let's even look at the hiding two color images in one gray. Mathematically, uh, how is it explainable that you can hide so much information in a gray image? Um, not to talk even about three images um, encoding, decoding there. Uh, do uh, you downscale like, the resolution? Like, uh, What's going so on? If, no, uh, no, uh, okay. So first, thank you very much for your question. I think that's very, very sharp question. Uh, 
that was the same question that that was same question I asked myself when I first uh, when I first read that news paper introduced in 2017. I I mean I read the paper and I found that the like they can hide one full color image in another with the same resolution. So yeah, indeed, it looks like um, a miracle, right? Like, uh, like how come? And then in, in the extension, they also try to hide two color images in one and it's still possible. And so, yeah, then that's also one of the mo main motivations for us to do this work. We want to understand what's, what's happening uh, there. For example, if we now go back to, to, uh, to this slide, now you will find that now, for example, I have a secret image, which like the secret image normal here, we assume is a nature image, right? The nature image has the property of low frequency, right? And then we use the, we fit this secret image into Heidi network. Uh, then we get this uh, encoded secret image, which has very high frequency property. And then when we add this generated encoded secret image or perturbation, we, we add this directly to any cover image, which again is a nature cover image, which, which would have yeah, low frequency. Yes, yeah, so now the Mathematically, it becomes a very simple question to say, if I now I, I add one high frequency signal into a low frequency signal, okay? And then the revealing network that's just tried, that's, that is trained to be implicitly to ignore the low frequency information and only extract the high frequency information and then transform this extremely high, high frequency emission back into the original low frequency. That's why then the human, you can see the extracted circuit image again. Does this answer question? Um, not all the way, no. Maybe uh, mm, when you're training, the, there were the two networks, I forgot the names, but when you're training the one that is encoding the image, is it trained on a specific set of images, um, the hiding network? Um, the input data for training oh, here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, now I come. I come back to the to the to the like the previous slide. Now we okay. see a two network here, right? one hiding network and one reading network. Mm -hmm. And like now, I will tell you how we how we train this network. Uh, so we just we put this image into this height network and we get this and then this go to the network and get get this image. And the way we train it. We just uh, we try to uh, minimize the the loss, which is which is to minimize the gap between the cover image and the container image, and this is this is the first loss. The second loss is we try to minimize the gap between the secret image and mm -hmm. the revealed secret image. So uh -huh. and then, yeah, and then in in terms of the data, we just put a random. Uh, images from the image net. Uh -huh. Actually, what we find is that here, it doesn't matter what kind of images that you use to train this data. This network has no problem of overfitting. As mm -hmm. long as you, you try to use uh, uh, random natural images, you will always get the same result. And when you test an image on another data set, the performance will be the same. You will, like, yeah, with our experience, we, like, yeah, here there's no overfitting uh, at all. Okay, but I'm still trying to understand how you can encode three images in one when the re resolution stays the same for all. And the only thing that I can understand mathematically is that you have data hiding inside of the hiding network and the revealing network that is explaining what's in the image. And to have data hiding, from what I understand, you need to have the secret images while during training need to be very specific. Um, to, to yeah, get this. Okay. Yeah, now come to your question to say how it's possible that, so, so first I assume you already understand how it's possible that we can hide one single color image in another yeah, one, okay? That's yeah, okay. okay. Now, now I, I assume you, you, you understand this. Now, what we are doing here, we're trying to 
uh, add the three uh, uh, perturbation into this uh, uh, curve image directly. And now, like uh, what we what we find is that now these uh, these three three uh, perturbations they have their own unique uh, frequency property. Mm -hmm. So then 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 that's why uh, then later like for example we have R one R two and R three here, which which has been like implicitly has been trained to only only uh, decode the corresponding frequency that's that they have been used uh, during the training. So then, uh, actually, here I, I I have to I have to clarify. During the training, we do not try to impose any explicit constraint to say what frequency H one and R one pair. This like let's call it a pair one or let's say a pair two. A, Pair three, we do not explicitly uh, say, "Oh, H one, uh, pair one, you guys use this frequency property. Uh, pair two, you guys use this frequency property." Mm -hmm. But it just say for the network to for the model to work, these during training process, the three pairs they will automatically uh, learn uh, learn to uh, hide and extract in their own in their own frequency. Uh, uh, property that can be distinguished uh, from the other pairs. Oh, okay. So yes. Yeah, so here, I mean, actually, we 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 didn't put this uh, this content on this slide, but we actually we, uh, tomorrow we will have the presentation for the because uh, tomorrow is still the NIPS uh, conference day, and our work uh, our work is uh, is scheduled uh, tomorrow. And we will, if yeah, and Good then, luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you, thank you, yeah. And I mean, they say uh, uh, like we have our paper online, and we also have the supplementary. And inside the supplementary, then we show that these three perturbations they have their own unique, uh, unique frequency property. You yeah. know what? So uh, that yeah, that's another, the reason why yeah. this works. Another question: What is the limit? How many perturbations can you make? Oh yeah, that's a very very uh, smart question. Uh, we didn't really experiment it uh, more than a three, but based on actually, like if you look carefully for the for the for the for three images, you can already see a little bit artifacts. So the image is not exactly the same as the original second image. So we assume that it would be no problem to hide the four or five, but and of course I think four or five you will see even more artifacts, and to hide. Like for example, uh, six or seven. I think it is still possible, but then you will see more and more um, artifacts, obviously. And and another question: If I were to decipher this, and I don't have your train networks, what's yeah. the way to go about it? Yeah, uh, let's say for example, uh, let's say let's say now uh, now you have the container image, right? Uh, you you have the C prime here, but you do not have the like like uh, the R1 or the R2 network, I will say in theory, you cannot get it back. Like because- uh, Is it complete? So you're saying this is complete coding basically? Yeah, because uh, even we as uh, like, we are the ones that have trained these three networks, right? Even we do know how they get, how they get a trend, like uh, what kind of frequency property that they have been, they have exploited Right, because these are uh, this training is all all automatic, and this is for example, if uh, if the other guy he he tries to let's say he has our training code, and no no problem, he can he can train this again. He can also get the three pairs of uh, uh, hiding and restricting network, but uh, almost hundred percent sure the three ones that they get will be very different from the, the three ones that we get. So it means that if they try to use any one of them, try to extract our secret message, they will get, they will get nothing. So the, in this sense, it means that the hiding and the reading network, they always need to work pair in pair, which means you have to train them uh, like, uh, you know, like at the same time. 
if, yeah, you cannot say you train another pair and there's a miracle, the H1 and the R1 might, um, like, might work well in pair. In, like, in, yeah, in our trial, it doesn't work. Uh, this uh, my mind is blown right now. It's basically you're offering here a better solution than RSA, like uh, a better encoding, a better better ciphering method than whatever exists right now. Because there's just no way to to attack that, if I'm understanding correctly. Uh, uh, okay, I wouldn't be arrogant to say that there's no way to <laughs> to decipher the less absolutely a no way to get it. And mm -hmm. actually, this uh, because for the concept of uh, stochastic, right? The whole point is not only to extract the message up. You say we can actually easily detect the existence of the message. Actually, it means that now if I give you this uh, container image, right? You yeah. can actually train a network easily detect there is secret message inside this container image. Uh, but, but that's okay. That's what happens when you cipher. You, there is a secret yeah. message. It's implicit. It's explicit that there is a secret message always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so which means that it, you can easily, uh, like you can easily uh, get a method to, to, to find that this container image actually has a secret image. Yes. But I would say it's very difficult or almost impossible for you to get the secret image out of it, unless you have our uh, train like network. our yeah our train yeah. networks. Wow. Yeah, I would, my I would mind is that. blown. I don't know what to say. This is, I need to think more after. Okay. Yeah, I I I hope that you you will you can go read our paper. It's online, and if you have yeah. more questions after reading our paper, you can like ask us. We can have more discussion. Is mm -hmm. you. It's very, uh, yeah. Okay, I will, can I continue? Yes, please, I'm sorry it took longer, but oh, no, 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 it's just okay. unexpected. Uh, yeah, the questions are very welcome. Yeah, and so, uh, so far we like, uh, we showed that our network can be used for the digital stagnancy. Now we try to, exp uh, I mean, like, uh, in essence, this is very simple uh, hiding network. We. When we were working on it, we want to know like was the like was the limit of it, right? Like the so then we try to we try to extend it for two and uh, for two other applications. One is called watermarking, and another one is called uh, photographic stagnancy, which is also called light field messaging. So let's look at the first uh, application first, watermarking, and the definition is say we hide some secret message. Uh, in the image, uh, in the image, for example, uh, for proving the ownership. And the challenge for this task is to say the encoding message must be robust to distortions, which means like the, uh, the attacker, they will try to apply some techniques to remove the, uh, uh, like the hidden uh, secret uh, messages, for example, all kinds of distortions, right? And then the second application called LFM, uh, the definition is to hide and transmit secret message by taking a photo on the screen display. And the challenge of this task is that uh, like when people take, use a camera to take a photo uh, from, the, from the screen display, uh, there will be a light effect, right? Like the, like, like, the photo on your camera will no longer be the same as a photo on original uh, on original computer, right? So for for both tasks, the problem is say this system has to be robust to either distortions or or light effect. Okay, so here for uh, for the what for the what marking, uh, we tried the. Uh, uh, to make it robust to different uh, uh, corruptions, uh, we tried with uh, drop out Gaussian uh, blow and um, JPEG, etc. And so we just applied these uh, uh, noises as an augmentation technique during the training, and then uh, then during the inference stage, it will be. We found that it it can be very. Uh, 
uh, robust. And there was one work that was first introduced in 2018, ECCV. Uh, and they have, done, they have done something very similar to us, but in, in their work, they, can, they could only hide a simple binary message, but we can hide the full, uh, the full uh, color image. I would say our work in this sense is, can, can extend the application to make it uh, yeah, more useful. And we also, uh, we, uh, we also apply this uh, simple universal deep hiding net, um, hiding net architecture in, uh, for task of uh, like field messaging. And uh, yeah, like uh, in 2018, uh, 2019, there was one CVPR paper uh, that did something very similar, but for them, uh, they need to collect like they need to collect uh, like 1.9 TB data set, which is like the corresponding uh, container image and the container photo, because they found that if they didn't do this process in the training, then uh, for the if they just do this in normally as before, then the like the the receiver site can is, can retrieve nothing. So then for them to make their network to be robust to such light effects, they collected 1.9 TB a data set. And since uh, when they use a certain, um, let's say camera and uh, the screen displays, they always, the data set they collected is will always be uh, dependent on that specific uh, uh, hardware. So then when their network is trained on on certain hardware, when they are tested on a different setup, the performance would be bad. And so with our network, uh, we do not need to collect this uh, data set at all. And we find that we can get much better performance. I would say it's quite significantly better. And also our work is, uh, is more versatile in the sense that it can also hide, can also hide images. And the reason for this success is uh, analyzed more in detail in the paper. If you are interested, you can give a look. Let's say why the previous network, why they have to collect their set, why, and why our network, uh, our architecture automatically admits this problem. And then finally, I would introduce uh, one uh, last work that we uh, we, we, that we will publish in this uh, new uh, Tube AI. Uh, actually, back to, uh, the origin submission title was slightly different. It was called Under uh, Towards Understanding Universal Adverse Perturbations uh, from the Frequency Perspective. And um, after the, the rebuttal, uh, taking the, the reviewer's uh, comments into account, we I decide to change the title to this new one. Uh, we call it Universal Adverse Perturbation Through the Lens of Deep Stigmatry Towards a Unified Fourier Perspective. Uh, okay, so basically now um, with the work that we did for the CPR, which is for the, uni for the universal uh, perturbation for attacking, and we also, we also here have uh, our NIPS work for the universal data hiding. Uh, now, like both of these paper, I would say in terms of performance, we achieved quite good performance, but still there is uh, like uh, something that is, uh, I think was quite counterintuitive to the human, which is that there exists a misalignment between the human vision and the model perception, right? For both uh, universal hiding and universal adverse attack. So in the case of uh, universal the hiding, we can find that the decoder network, the definitely thing that the is more aligned with the perturbation. Uh, uh, the content image is more aligned to the perturbation. But for human, the content image is definitely aligned with curve image, which is the same for the universe adverse attack. So then, since we observed uh, this uh, vision misalignment in both tasks, we will say, okay, can we try to 
uh, analyze and give a unified explanation for both tasks. And inspired by our like frequency explanation understanding um, for the deep hiding, universe deep hiding, we try to extend it here for also understand for the universe adversary attack. So first we observe that even though uh, the is a universal adverse attack. So basically it's like, say we say a single perturbation that can attack um, like all classes, right? And we empirically, we, we uh, checked and we found that there exists so-called robust and non-robust classes, which means that when you try to perform a target attack, the target attack rate for robust and non-robust classes is 40% and 100% respectively. Here there's a huge gap. For example, here we try to visualize some, uh, some of the robust classes and the least robust classes. And so I would say at first sight, when you see the image on, when you see images on the, on the left, you will find that you will say the most robust classes, those uh, samples seem to have quite complex feature, kind of high frequency content, right, inside it. And when you, when you see the nanobus classes, they seem to all have this kind of, uh, kind of flat regions. For example, in the case of the wash bin, in many cases, like the whole, the whole sample is just something like uh, wide, like a, which occupies a large region. And then, uh, so we suspect that that's, um, they have a very, the, this uh, robust number of classes have different frequency properties. And then we perform the Fourier analysis and which confirms our conjecture, which is that indeed those robot classes, they have a, a very high frequency property in general and the, the number of classes, they have the low frequency properties. And here uh, for those audience that uh, uh, have no experience with this uh, transform image, here like the trend, the transformed image here is like in the middle is the low frequency and on the border part is high frequency, right? So for some here, on the border part uh, is quite dark. And then on upside, the border relatively is more, um, is more bright than, than the transformed images on the bottom. That's why we conclude to say uh, robot classes have uh, more high frequency content. And then here, uh, we try to uh, arrive at a, a unified uh, full perspective on UAP and UDH. And here we try to order, like in the image that I said, we have uh, total, we have floating classes. And then we, here we, uh, we have three metrics. Uh, one is called target attack rate, which is for task of UAP. We have uh, another, um, uh, metric called secret APD, uh, which is basically measure uh, the difference between the retrieved uh, secret image and the original secret image, which is for task of UDH. And then we have another metric, which is called entropy of the full image. And this metric is, is like we try to, we, you, we, we adopt this uh, metric for, for quantifying the frequency because in the literature, we cannot find any, any metric that uh, does this job. So that's why we propose this, this one by ourselves. And first, uh, let's look at the, the figure on the top uh, right. So here, what we try to do here, we try to order the thousand classes uh, for these two different metrics. And then we, then we after ordering, we, we just plot them and visualize them directly. So here you can see a clear uh, positive correlation between these two metrics. But when you think about it, these two tasks are, seem to totally irrelevant, right? One is for adverse attack, one is for deep hiding. Why would the, they have any positive uh, correlation between them? So again, we then we then say we ask a simple question: What would be the factor that determines this high correlation? And the answer is quite simple: just the frequency. Um, so then we uh, to to confirm this, we 
um, we also uh, visualize the two, like the ordering with the uh, with the metric of entropy and targeted attack rate. Uh, with this figure, we find that oh, is uh, this targeted attack rate has a very high uh, positive correlation with entropy, which is the frequency. And for uh, for the other one, we find that the entropy also has very high, pro high positive correlation with uh, um, the secret APD for, for VDH. So which means that this, the frequency is the factor that uh, determines this high correlation. If entropy uh, um, has high correlation with uh, both of them, so then it's not surprising uh, uh, that these uh, two uh, seemingly uh, irrelevant tasks would have a high positive correlation, right? And so for this task, uh, because our main uh, focus is, is still trying to understand how UAP works, right? Um, so then here we try to uh, get the, uh, like the UAP with uh, uh, kind of a frequency, uh, kind of, how say, uh, like, um, we try to uh, constrain the frequency of the UAP uh, during the training process. And for example, on left, on the top side, we try to make the, we try to constrain, we try to force the population to be in the domain of uh, low frequency. And then uh, here, like FR uh, indicates the fooling ratio. So you can see that when the UAP has very low frequency, you can see the full ratio is very high. For example, the, the, the top left one, the full ratio is only 14.5%. And uh, then when we increase the, like, the frequency, the full ratio gets higher and higher. But then on the bottom side, which, when we try to force the population to be only in the high frequency domain, we find that the full ratio is much higher than when we control it. Uh, to be only in the in the low frequency domain. Uh, yeah, so here we come to conclusion that the UAP fails when high frequency content is removed, and on the contrary, uh, like I said, removing low frequency content from UAP has a trivial effect. So this actually answers our question in the beginning: say why uh, UAPs of uh, smaller magnitude dominate images? Uh, why does this happen? And the answer here is to uh, are quite straightforward. Just say DNNs are more sensitive to high frequency content, and at the same time, UAPs uh, have high frequency properties. In this case, like when you train UAP, the algorithm just exploits this the the property of DNNs being uh, sensitive to high frequency content to 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 make the general UAP have high frequency properties. And finally, uh, we try to uh, come up with uh, like um, a training uh, pipeline, I would say, uh, try to uh, put both perturbations at once. So as you can see here, uh, here we can have an encoder DNN, have a decoder DNN, uh, which is the same as before what we did for the university of Heidi. But the difference here is that now when we try to put this uh, perturbation into the into a sort uh, into the cover image, it will also uh, fool the target DNN network. For example, in this case, the network will say is a spider web. So basically now, and also one since this whole thing is universal, so we, which means that now uh, when we uh, when we like test it, we put this USAP. Uh, uh, onto like most images on the in on their image net, we found that around eighty percent, if I remember correctly, around eighty percent of time, all the images the target get and will say is a spider web instead of the original uh, the ground truth uh, uh, label. And also, when you then you put the image into the into the decoder, you can always get this uh, secret image. Uh, back out of it. So that's why we call this thing to be uh, universal secret adversarial perturbation. Basically, it has a secret, and at the same time, it achieves the goal of adversarial attack. 
So the takeaway for today for the presentation done by me and my coworker, uh, Philip, is obviously it's quite simple. It just say for the, uh, even though the deep learning has been widely used in, in a wide range of applications, and I think it's very important for, uh, for the audience or for, for the researchers to, to know that uh, what you see, what humans uh, see is not always what the machine sees, right? And second thing is that um, uh, uh, between these two uh, tasks, adversarial attack and data hiding, they shared the, uh, the phenomenon of a vision misalignment. So we think in the future, uh, there should be uh, more work on uh, this joint uh, investigation and explanation. Uh, yeah, I would say that's the, uh, that's the end of our like presentation, and um, yeah, I I would like like we would like to hear more question from audience if any. Okay. That's it for our presentation so far. Can you still hear us? Because we just plugged off the... I have the feeling everything is stuck right now. Hmm? That's true, we cannot see him, right? Let's move, right? Oh, I see. Hmm? I think we are still online, but I think Peter um, is actually not connected anymore. Um, one second. Could someone uh, quickly um, post something in the chat such that we can see uh, if you guys can still hear us? Hello, okay. Okay, chat. <laughs> yeah, just to uh, to anyone who's still who's still online. Okay, very good, very nice. Um, so we have a lot of questions right now. Um, Jonathan Wagner asked if it's easier to defend against universal attacks in general. Do you want to answer that? Yeah, I would say that's true. That's actually, uh, there are already some works that, uh, that work on this topic, how to defend the US adversary attack. Uh, uh, but so far, from to my knowledge. Okay, uh, I think it's working, yeah. right? Uh, you're back. Oh, you're back? <laughs> I was sure it's going to close for everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so I will continue to, to answer the question again. It's easier to defend adverse, against adverse, universal adverse attacks in general. Yeah, first question is yes, but and uh, so far, to my knowledge, uh, all the work that has has working on this field, they do not try to exploit the property of the property to be universal to to defend it. So basically, the method they proposed can also defend against the image dependent ones. So uh, I think that doesn't make sense because I think it's actually easier, and that's actually our next. Uh, uh, we are actually working on one or two papers on this uh, on this question. We try to defend against the universal adversarial attack. Yes. Then um, in the chat in YouTube, somebody asked um, if we tried to add perturbations only to the area where the object is present, and therefore I can say we did not try this. By ourselves, but there are actually papers who try to or who try to restrict the um, area of the perturbation or the universal adversarial perturbation even to only this uh, to only a certain area or only the object area, and they seem also to have success with that. And I'm also quite confident that this actually would work that you can just restrict the perturbation to a certain only to a certain area. Actually, in general, I would say uh, I would say it doesn't really matter to differentiate between the foreground or the background of the images. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Then, then another question was um, that there are a lot of techniques of neural networks for blurring or downscaling the images, or also like increasing the resolution or like upscaling in general. And the question is, um, if we can easily get rid with adversarial ex uh, of the adversarial examples with this one. And um, the simple question is, yes, there were um, plenty of defenses that, tr that uh, proposed upscaling um, or even downscaling or JPEG compression and things like this as a defense. But as we touched on in our presentation, as soon as, def as the defender um, knows no, about the this, uh, as the attacker knows about this defense, he can actually craft a perturbation or craft an attack that will also attack this defense mechanism. And then in the chat, and which I will also forward to uh, Peter, um, I, po I uh, po posted the paper of the obfuscated gradients, which touches on this topic more, more on detail. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and for the audience that uh, are interested in this topic, something actually me and Philip, we have always been very actively seeking cooperation on working on these uh, topics. If any one of you happens to be interested in these topics, don't has don't has don't be hesitant to contact us for uh, conducting uh, cooperation in any form. Is when we say this, we are serious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah, um, I can only agree, yeah. Um, I have to say, for, guys, uh, this, um, your, uh, your way of encoding those images inside of images, I come from cybersecurity background. Um, I I've, during your talk, I've been sending this to a couple of friends who are very strong in this field, just because uh, I didn't think something yeah. like this is possible. I would really want to see how it's possible to attack the the ciphering yeah. method. Um, yeah. Let, if there yeah, is any yeah. reference, I would love I would love to get it, please. Uh, I would yeah. I would also like to touch on that topic um, briefly. So as Chowning said, um, this image is then encoded in some certain frequency frequency property, right? Frequency band, if you want to say so. It's added to the image, and then the decoder only looks basically into this frequency range, whatever, to decode it, right? So um, what you can, so, and until now, um, I think there is not many work who specifically go into um, this deep hiding, since this is quite a new topic. I mean, for steganography, there are a lot of works who try to uh, detect the steganography um, and yeah, but for the deep hiding, I think it's very easy to detect that um, something has been hidden. Yeah. But what we are really not sure is how much, how well can we reconstruct it? And I think there, we actually also uh, probably will do some research in that direction. Um, That's why we it, need more cooperators. Yeah, and <laughs> and uh, but I think. If you have the data, for example, this image was encoded to uh, this image, then it's quite easy to uh, train a decoder, right? I think it's yeah. also a question of the data availability. Also, what I would mention is on a first view, um, it's already very easy to just amplify this perturbation that you encoded and see some kind of pattern. For example, uh, let's say you encoded a cat you can somehow see that some uh, some patterns of a cat, something like this, since it's just in the high frequency, right? Yes. And also explained it's uh, it's spatially spatially local. Uh huh. So uh, ah, is it? I thought it was a spread out without locality of space because when you showed the images that come out from the fr from the hiding network, it looks like it's just random noise. No, it's uh, not. No, random. no, no. It's, it's actually is 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 the opposite. It's very mm. it's encoded in a very uh, in this on the special dimension. It's only it's, it's within the the distance maybe two or three pixels. But mm. yeah, in my opinion, this is also 
maybe just a prime of loss function if you want to increase the um, the yeah the how it's encoded it's much more encoded in much, in a much more random sense maybe you can design something um, that is, that this will uh, that you can achieve that but that's for now I think hypothetical hypothetical so I'm not sure one hundred percent sure about that. And, and I can add something here slightly. Like it's also due to the due to the nature of convolution, right? Because yes, here we are using convolution and what to do. And since convolution by itself, like especially, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a yeah. stupid remark by my end. It's just because I saw the image and I didn't think all the way through. But you're right. No, no, no. Actually, that was actually a very sharp question. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, I, I was looking over the slides on the link. Uh, there's oh, most of the slides aren't there, so we will need the, yeah. the lecture slides. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. I will share it with a couple of people for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I will update them, send them to you, and yeah. Yeah, and for yeah. collaborations, uh, first of all, um, people who are gonna watch this video now will see that you're interested in collaborations. But also, if you're interested, you can post something on our group about this specific topic, and you're looking like an image, example image, and that you're looking for somebody to collaborate on this, there might be, and I will spread it out to other groups and, and people very might nice. might jump on it. Um, that would be very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. yeah, because we are seriously seeking more corporations. <laughs> <laughs> go, so go ahead, please uh, post it and I will, I will spread it out. Okay, thank you very much for that. <laughs> uh, for yeah. Any more yeah. questions? Um, I mean, in YouTube, there were a couple of few smaller ones. Mm -hmm. um, one was how, how do you measure that C and C prime are looking alike? And that is simply by having this magnitude constraint that has to be kept very small. Um, yeah. Then do you use discrete or continuous data types in the neural network? So there are indeed those discrete neural networks. And um, for now, in this presentation, we only covered the continuous, continu continuous ones um, where the parameters are in the float. But there are definitely um, works in the research community who attack also those discrete neural networks or those discretized neural networks with the discrete weights. They are called binary neural networks. Yeah, binary. I, I actually I blanked on the name. Uh, they are those binary neural networks. Um, there are also attacks on that. Um, I wasn't sure, maybe this question was also going into if the perturbation is discrete, is in the discrete or in the continuous image space, and yeah. we are handling the continuous image space. That's actually a very, uh, very, very important question, because we found that most papers in the field of uh, adverse attack or hiding, they actually do not do the, yeah, the, like their resulting thing is actually in the float. But the, as we, we agree, this is actually not practical, right? Because practical image is always uh, in the integer. And actually, in the, our NIPS paper, we we covered it a bit. We try to convert we try to convert this float number into integer number, and we tested how much this would affect the performance. And this uh, this this quotation, uh, like decrease the performance a little bit. But um, yeah, not that, not that, not that significant. But to, to my knowledge, because we only tested on for the, the hiding, the performance decreases seems to be not that significant. But to my knowledge, if it's for the adverse attack, I saw another paper just a few days ago. It seems that this small decreasing has very high impact actually. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, that's it for the questions from the from the YouTube chat. Yeah, I also think we we went 45 minutes over time. So if there's yeah. any questions, anybody, please ask now. Otherwise, I think it's a good time to wrap up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was quite some time. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and we are also doing something in parallel, like uh, maybe in, in the future, we can we can prepare another one to like we we we, all, we feel always so so delighted to have chance to share our work with more with more uh, people. Uh, for sure. So we can even talk in two, three months. Let some let yeah. this information, you know, sink down. And two, three months, we can have you over again um, yeah, with new, new stuff for sure. Um, yeah. We're actually doing this with. There is a lecture next week or two weeks after. He was. We hosted him in, in September. Now he's teaching yeah. a different topic, but it was a good, good thing. So for sure. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to wrap it up. Um, 
Uh, thank you, everybody who's still here after almost three, two and a half hours. Wow. Um, yeah, this was, know, I think we peaked, we peaked on, the, on YouTube. There were like 10 people and here on the Zoom, there were 20. This was our peak the, after the half hour mark, I feel. Um, we're reaching a thousand people. Actually, we are at a thousand people on Reddit after less than half a year. So thank you for everybody in the audience for participating um, from everywhere around the world. Um, thank you, Philip. Thank you, Chowning, for, for, for giving this amazing talk today. Um, is this a time for me to encourage if anybody knows of anyone else who is doing something interesting in the field who wants to share and teach us, please send them my way and, I will, and we will make this happen. Um, you can find us on Reddit, on Discord. All the links were sent several times um, for, for every, all the discussions. And I think uh, this is it. Um, yeah, thank you very thank much. You <laughs> great, great what you're doing. Thank you. Keep thank on you. going. Yeah, thank yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.